If you enjoy this video, please consider supporting me on Patreon. For the small asking amount of $1 per project, your name can appear at the beginning of this and many other upcoming videos. In November of 2019, YouTube animator and artist Bibsy Pop, most known for making Kesha AMVs with her own OCs, uploaded a pilot she and her team had been working on for a full series called Has Been Hotel. And everyone knows the rest of the story. If you've been on the internet at all for the past five years, it's almost impossible to not know about Has Been Hotel and its spin-off series, Hell of a Boss. Or, as I call it due to how off the rails season two is going, Hell's Scandalous Showman. Fifty Pop and her independent animation outfit, Spindle Horse Studios, have made an absolute splash with these two pilot episodes to the point of becoming a poster child of internet success stories. You and a handful of associates make a full pitch out of a project you've had in the works for almost a decade funded by your fan base's donations, it gets millions of views to near universal critical praise, and a television network picks it up and makes it a full series to air on a major streaming service? That's something most creators can only dream of. Since I have a habit of being late to the party when covering things, having this funny little thing called a job and possible undiagnosed ADHD or autism will do that, and this pilot episode is still canned the main series, I might as well start my foray into talking about this series here if it's going to become a new regular customer on the channel. After all, you guys voted for this to be the 3,000 subscriber milestone, and who am I to deny you devoted kids Skylarks? Seriously, though, thank you for your support. Before we go up to the concierge desk and check in, though, I might as well lay down the ground rules in that while I may be pointing out what's been said about the full version in regards to any changes, I'll be talking strictly about the original pilot and why it worked as a sales pitch. Any changes between the debut and the official first episode on Amazon Prime will be saved for a dedicated section of that review or made into its own video as a springboard for discussion of the full series. All right, let's get going. Hasbin Hotel's pilot makes quite the first impression within two minutes, opening first with some shadow puppet-themed animation describing our protagonist's plight and setting the stage for what we'll find out a bit later. Believe it or not, I'm always chasing rainbows, as great of an unofficial Disney Golden or Silver Age song as it is, was not originally written for this pilot. Composed by Harry Carroll with lyrics by Joseph McCarthy, the song came out all the way back in 1917 during World War I, and it was used to great effect in relation to our main lead, Charlie. You can see that in how a song about the human desire for happiness and a better future, pursuit of something elusive, is juxtaposed with what looks like the aftermath of a war zone and hell survivors just going back to their business like nothing happened. All the while, Charlie grieves from a balcony, wishing for something like the sparing of her people that will never happen in all likelihood. Honestly, this song is just beautiful, and Elsie Lovelock perfectly nails the feeling of classic and beloved Disney princesses in her performance. I'm going to start skipping around around a bit instead of the usual scene-by-scene -scene recap, but I promise it'll make sense in the long run, especially since I introduced her. I need to talk about Charlie. We just went through another extermination. We lost so many souls, and it breaks my heart to see my people being slaughtered every year. No one is even given a chance! I can't stand idly by while the place I live is subjected to such violence! Charlie is this universe's crown princess of hell, and she's an absolute ray of sunshine. Must protect. Having been born and raised here, she's seen more of her people culled by the yearly exterminations than she can count, and witnessing this can't be easy. So, to lessen the casualties, Charlie has been working on a passion project for a while that would rehabilitate sinners, believing that people can change and a second chance should be offered and the redemption would prevent, or at the very least, cut down on hell's overpopulation. In a way, Charlie reminds me of a little of a fairy from Homestuck, both being absolute sweethearts that want the best for their people and offering a solution to the endless cycle of violence their societies are infected by, even if their idea is a bit too optimistic for what they're working with. 
too bad for Fairy and her friends got swept up in a game and the apocalypse it triggered and was killed off so her dreams couldn't even be put in motion. Charlie prepares to propose her rehabilitation plan for the segment the local news begrudgingly brought her on for, where she'll explain the process and try to persuade Hell's viewers to give it a shot. For anyone starting a new service or plan for even small social changes, a step you don't want to skip is having a social proof to present that'll convince people that success is possible and that'll make them want to join. For Charlie, she's got one test client that shows promise and can act as her social proof. Put a pin in this. Her pitch goes about as well as expected. The idea of a hotel for sinners is laughed down by everyone tuned in, and since there's a lot going on on screen, this gives me a perfect excuse to talk about the art direction and character designs. Vipsy Pop has an art style that you either really love or you really hate, and it's easy to see why. A lot of the character designs have so much detail put into them and make them interesting to look at, and convey the whole demon and goth aesthetic, but at the same time, you have some that are over-designed to the moon and back, even if they're just in view for a few seconds. We're talking nonsensical, cluttered, deviant art OCs that a middle schooler getting a bit carried away with drawing would come up with. Which is funny, because a good chunk of our main cast our characters Viv held on to since then, and likely where her emotional maturity stopped. Granted, the 2010s overall has had a problem with overly simplified character designs, and it's nice to see a production that's not afraid to give a few more bells and whistles to the art direction, but there's cases in here where the overcorrection is comical. Husk, Velvet, Angel Dust, and Aspects of Alistair are probably the most ridiculous ones. Husk being a rambunctious crow casino cat in the hat is as silly as it sounds, and I don't know how I'd modify it while still keeping the same idea. Angel being a spider in a skinny tweak besides outlining a very common pattern with Vip's male character designs has one of the more difficult to animate looks because that's another set of limbs to keep track of, and thin objects are a lot harder to keep consistent than thick ones. Velvet's pilot design looks like gothic Lolita chords that even Mylanu would think looks too silly, and her first appearance in the full release is going to be the most stylish and balanced that design can get. And Alistair's haircut is so goofy that if those tufts were intended to be ears to match his deer motif, a couple of lines and a small pop of accent color would do wonders to communicate that better. There's also a certain controversy about Velvet and Alistair's designs that I'm neither interested nor qualified to talk about, so let's leave it alone. Also, I almost forgot, but the amount of eyes on Serpentius is just ridiculous. But if you want to know what really took the cake, ate it, and made an overused meme out of it when it comes to the Bibsy Pop character designs, look no further than Beelzebub. All I'll say now, because I could expand my thoughts in the Hell Scandalous Showman overview, is that I can literally feel my hand cramping just looking at her, whether she's standing still or in motion. Speaking of, yes, those are indeed the prototype designs of Blitz and Luna. Moxie's in there too, supposedly, but I can't find them. As for these color palettes, there's no dodging complaints of me being an unpleasable tampon holster about it, but the amount of red used is absurd. It's hell, yes. But it wouldn't hurt to use a few more Halloween colors like purple, orange, and even yellows and accent greens in the backgrounds to differentiate different times of day in other settings. For comparison's sake, look at any shot from El Tigre and the various colors over Miracle City. A similarly dangerous place, but just having earthy tones for the city buildings and letting the tone in time be set with the color of the sky and light tinting everything to match works wonders. What doesn't help is that the full release made this problem worse by having the whole cast, with few exceptions, make the exact same shade of Demon Red a major color in the reference sheet, and that shade of red already fills the background, and this bled over to Hell's Scandalous Showman once the office comedy premise was fully shafted. I think the only reason the show's setting went with so much of this color is because it would be indistinguishable from Los Angeles or Chicago otherwise. A point I can expand on when I get to the full series. The one thing I can't complain about is the animation quality because god damn, look how silky smooth and fluid this moves. There's a couple moments of jank, but the scenes they occur in are usually charming or funny enough to make me ignore it. The zaniness continues in Charlie's next musical number, Inside Every Demon is a Rainbow, which against all all advice is supposed to be her project hook, and everything is always on the move. It takes multiple rewatches to get everything, and overall, a very energetic scene. That once again gets laughed down. Wow! That was shit. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie 
really, really gets no respect despite being the crown princess, and that created some discussion about whether or not it's because everyone sees her as a literal kid, or if sinners really don't care about redemption because they ended up here for her terrible actions and behaviors. Besides, hell literally caters to those vices. Why should they care? I've also seen a couple people on social media complain when this pilot first came out about this idea because in a rehabilitation center for awful people, apparently that includes reforming career criminals such as actual real-life serial killers and people who have hurt children. And I think that's people looking way too deep into things. For all we know, there could be a vetting system in place preventing these kinds of oversights, but I'm not going to stake my life entirely on it because it boils down to whether or not someone wants to work toward redemption and earn that better life. Which which a great number of people who go to hell don't want to do. Charlie then presents her proof of concept by going over her test client's progress, and that raises a couple eyebrows. So let's rewind a bit and meet this client. <laughs> Thanks for the fun time, hot stuff. Yeah, yeah, listen. Keep this discreet, you hear me? I can't let it get out I'm offering my services to randos on the street. It was a quick cash grab. Got it? Well, that interview is going on, or just a bit before things kick off on the studio, we get introduced to the concept of turf wars in hell and a peep at regular life there. This is Angel Dust, fanboy Spider, an adult film star that's been staying at the hotel for a couple of weeks at this point. While he's definitely humoring Charlie and trying to stick to the rehabilitation program, really the only reason he's staying there is because it's effectively rent-free, and I like his thought process that he's not relapsing into habits that sent him to hell in the first place as long as he doesn't get caught. Another loophole he found is by helping his pal Cherry Bomb, he's technically doing a solid for someone he's owed for some time. I think that was the best starting point for Angel's arc and Charlie's challenge because of what they pose for each other. On Angel effectively doing the bare minimum and exploiting loopholes to stay at the hotel rent-free, you get a starting point for someone in it, mostly for themselves, but later scenes show that there's some merit as to why he's the guinea pig for this project. Angel is a social person, but the kinds of company he keeps, or spoiler alert, is kept by Save for Charlie and the hotel staff run counterproductive to self-improvement. This also loops back into some of the realities that Charlie overlooked or just failed to spot check on. Real talk, if you think someone is just going to waltz into rehab and stick to the program and never have moments of relapse or cheating on the regimen ever, you've either never dealt with issues like addiction, or you've been in treatment for that and stopped before any notable progress was made and are a damn liar. And if you don't think that anyone would ever accept some form of professional help just for personal gain and a free ride, you'd also be wrong. On the note of turf wars and the type of company Angel keeps, Cherry is pretty cool as a concept. Considering what's been shown off in the pilot, she's got prowess as a fighter, and it looks like she's been at defending and expanding her turf for a while. Of course she'd think that Angel going to rehab is a silly idea. It's stifling compared to the adrenaline rush of absolutely wrecking shit. As for their challenger here, this is Serpentius, a Victorian snick with some steampunk leanings given his preference for using airships and dressing in a suit and top hat and his minions the Egg Boys. Pentius is one of those sillier kinds of villains that have the potential for being a recurring nuisance, and I love him for it. Even if the full release didn't go down the route with him that it did, his over-the-top and hammy performance is a joy to watch and reminds me of another villain with egg motifs and flying artillery that made audiences piss themselves laughing. You see, the joke is, this fight scene is pretty good, energetic with some good jokes and zingers. Footage of Pentius and Cherry's involvement was already being covered by the time Charlie's broadcast segment aired, and now we're going to snap back to Angel being presented as proof of concept, only for the earlier coverage to update, showing Angel Dust getting in on the action, and that bites Charlie in the ass. Oops. You can cut the tension on the ride back to the hotel with a knife. Angel knows he screwed Charlie over, something her second-in-command really hammers in, and it doesn't really do anything to get through to Angel. This is Vaggy. This name, several years later, is still stupid and doesn't sit right with me. Charlie's best friend and ambiguous love interest, and as a character, I really don't have a lot to work with. She's easily the least interesting character so far, with her connection to Charlie being the only thing to her outside of acting as second-in-command on planning the hotel project. She tries to keep everyone on straight and narrow, at least, something I'll call very advanced foreshadowing, and the execution is a bit dry and just falls on deaf ears anyway. For causing humiliation on live TV and putting the project pitch appeal on the level of a Chris Chan dating sim, Charlie is incredibly generous for not dropping Angel from the project and continuing to let him stay at the hotel rent-free. Hell, you can tell it really knocked the wind out of her sails, and while Angel considers saying something or even apologizing, his body language 
expressions in the shot show that he'd probably put himself in more hot water or just make things worse, so it's better to just leave her alone. So now we have Sunshine Baby at her lowest. She thinks she's a failure, her attempt to save her people is wasted, and I'm about ready to jump to the screen and hug this absolute bean! And as if on cue, that's about to all get turned around as one character shows up and steals the entire show. May I speak now? You may. Alistair, pleasure to be meeting you, sweetheart. Quite a pleasure. Excuse my sudden visit, but I saw your fiasco on the picture show, and I just couldn't resist. What a performance! Why, I haven't been that entertained since the stock market crash of 1929. <laughs> so many orphans. There's a reason this lost Cuphead boss became an absolute fan favorite when Hasbin decided to take the leap to animation instead of just staying a collection of OC shenanigans in Vivzi's high school sketchbook. For one, he's without a doubt the funniest character in the series without having to suffer from a chronic case of Sailor Mouth. Hold that thought, I'll come back to it. Watching him mess with people like he graduated top of the class from the Bugs Bunny School of Comedy is incredibly entertaining. More on him being bad news in this universe in a bit as well, but with that little bit of dramatic irony in mind, combined with the chumminess, it's incredibly charming and keeps you on your toes with how things play out next. Alistair is, indeed, that man who wants to watch the world burn because he gets enjoyment out of suffering and cruelty and doesn't mince words about comedy being based in misery like Doug Wall. What especially helps is Edward Bosco's performance. He absolutely slays the 1920s radio announcer energy and style and the distortion effects they gave his recordings that fluctuate in prominence to make him sound like an actual radio broadcast from when your great grandpappy was young, wild, and free is just the sugar on the cream. And now that strawberry gear got me doing it. God fucking damn it. When I say that Alistair in this universe is bad news, this goes back to how he came to hell, and as expository as it is, there wasn't much a pilot could really work with in laying that out, and this was the best it could do. The backing visuals are some of the coolest shots in this episode as well. Almost like creepier and more hellish versions of the Cuphead show title cards, I am going to keep bringing that franchise up adjacent to Alistair, and you can't do anything about it. With more stylized, almost puppet-like movies, Movement. What Alistair's deal is, is that he's not your garden variety demon, and he's powerful enough to topple overlords, and he even broadcast his carnage for all of hell to hear, as it's implied the scope of damage he deals includes overwhelmingly permanent double death, not unlike a certain green demon I'll be talking about in October. There's also his deal making with unsuspecting souls that effectively put you under his control, and given that Alistair derives glee from messing with people, Charlie has to outline her turn for Alistair sticking around as a direct order from the Crown than a full partnership or binding deal. Alistair agrees to these terms, and this makes him a compelling obstacle for the story because we know he's in it for the entertainment of watching spectacular relapse as well as ulterior motives that the full release can then give us breadcrumbs to what those ulterior motives are. He's an active mystery, but he still has a set of rules he adheres to, and anything he does makes sense. And that's the main reason why Gamzee is a plot device and the writing regarding him was complete shit. While Alistair is getting familiarized with the hotel and bringing on board a couple more staff members to help out, I'll swing back around to the comedy of Has Been Hotel and looking back on it five years later, was this pilot particularly funny? The answer is yes and no. There's funny moments, but humor is a total your mileage may vary area, and I guess no better place to start than the chronic case of Sailor Mouth comment I made earlier. Anything made by Vivzy Pop uses swearing and sex jokes so liberally that it honestly gets incredibly stale. Way too often the joke is just a swear it's word or blurting out something hard, related Daddy. to fucking, and it gets very annoying very quickly and makes you wonder if the real target audience are the boys I went to middle school with. And I know some brain surgeon is currently hammering away at the keyboard about to comment, but to Mag Emma, you like homestuck and panty and stocking, and those things are riddled with swearing and sex jokes, you hypocritical bitch. But stop for one second. When it comes to panty and stocking, that was part of the joke itself. Quoth pan pizza of Rebel Taxi. I don't like shows being raunchy. What I like is when a show is funny and happens to be disgusting. And any time it delves into shock humor, it happens to hit more effectively than anything in the show that inspired it, Drawn Together. Drawn Together will never be South Park, and the salt the creators had for Trey and Matt won't change that. And then we have Homestuck, and it looks like I have nothing to logic my way out of, because all these kids talk like they're in a Call of Duty lobby, and I say yes, that's the point. 
It plays into the coming of age themes with kids acting more adult because puberty is weird and you go through all sorts of growing pains trying to act how you think is cool and when you throw an apocalypse causing video game in the mix, then that rush to grow up feels like more than you bargained for. Also with Homestuck, the swears are either reserved for emphasis or you have a few characters who don't swear or swear very little compared to the rest of the cast. <laughs> Hi, Editing Magma here, realizing I said a bunch about the swearing and lewd jokes and Homestuck pertaining to the themes and excusing the humor of panty and stocking without pr really presenting the thrust of these being funny despite this kind of humor. I guess what I was trying to say is that in Anything Made by Bibsy Pop, the sex murder party is supposed to be the joke, while in Panty and Stocking, there actually is a joke, and it happens to be the sex murder party or packaged in that context. They are not the same. Also, Homestuck manages to have a bunch of slapstick and absurdist humor, so it's not relying on Car Cat Dave and the narrator coming up with creatively vulgar insults or anyone alluding to a bucket of naughty bedroom pastimes for all 8,000 plus pages. There's the clarification, and now back to your regular programming. <laughs> That was a lot about the hell versus bread and butter for comedy, but the timing of jokes can also make or break the humor. You know, I was going to bring Alistair back up as an example, but get a load of the timing in these exchanges. And what can you do, my effeminate fellow? I can suck your dick. Ha! No. Your loss. My friend, I am doing some charity work, so I took it upon myself to volunteer your services. I hope that's okay. Are you shitting me? Hmm. No, I don't think so. You think I'm some kind of fucking clown? Maybe. The timing and delivery of the punchline send me into orbit every time. Some jokes lose their impact because they're going at breakneck speed and you don't have time to take in what's going on to fully process the joke. Let me know when you come up with something creative to call me, you sack of poorly packaged horse shit. At the very least, the pilot doesn't suffer from jokes that are too slowly paced, and I can't say that any one joke wears out its welcome because of the fast pace. Speaking of fast pace, this is where the story gets a bit cramped as we throw in a couple more characters to the hotel staff. First up is Nifty. Nifty is adorable. She's like a cracked up Pinkie Pie, and I'll protect this little murder bean with my life. She gets housekeeping duties, which quickly becomes apparent with her speed, efficiency, and keen sense of detail, leaving no speck of dust or errant bug lying around. Alistair then pulls in Husk from the middle of a poker game and appoints him the barkeep. Having a bar around at all seems counterproductive to the hotel's aims, but unlike what D.A.R.E. programs tried to preach, there's really nothing wrong with the occasional drink. It's drinking to excess and developing an addiction that's the problem. I'm not really going to fault anyone for siding with Vaggy here on making sure the lobby stays dry to keep former alcoholics from reactivating their disease, though I'm just gonna say that drinking is one vice you should never go cold turkey trying to quit because the associated withdrawal has disastrously terrifying results. Go look up those horror stories yourself because YouTube already has its finger on the trigger pointing that sniper rifle at me for everything it has been I've covered so far. With everyone heading it off and Charlie getting the wind back in her sails, what better way to... <clears throat> Christian, the hotel, then a princess in the frog shadow man jamboree. Since we're on the topic of the third song in this pilot, which is a reprise of Inside Every Demon is a Rainbow, if it hasn't already made itself apparent, this series is going to be a musical and the soundtrack will really make or break it. Luckily for this pilot, all the songs further the story as they should sound really nice and their accompanying visuals suit the mood perfectly. Sonic Underground, as much as I unironically like this series, is a complete trash fire at this and it makes it all the more obvious that it was built from the ground up to give Deke royalties from the music. The songs all come right out of nowhere and commit the cardinal sonic sin of being terrible. More recently, Wish fails of being a Disney movie overall and having overly poppy, ill-written, poorly integrated songs doesn't do it any favors. It could be confirmed that this entire film was written with an AI and it wouldn't phase me. Okay, speaking of Disney, the instrumental tracks are on par with the average Disney series, fitting for the scenes they're in, but you only think about them while they're currently playing. When you get an instrumental that you want to listen to on its own, such as Tenga Step from Panty and Stocking, you know you've got some exceptional music. I could probably talk about the voice acting some more when I get to the full release, but it's fantastic and how these VAs did has definitely grown on people. Jill Harris as Charlie and Elsie Lovelock providing her singing voice, Michael Kovac as Angel Dust, Edward Bosco as Alistair, and Gabriel C. Brown providing a singing voice, Monica Franco as Baggy, Michelle Marie as Nifty, Will Stamper as Serpentious, and Joe Grant as the Egg Voice, Crystal Laporte as Cherry Bomb, and Mick Lawer as Husk are all iconic, so the recap casting of the full series was going to be disappointing for many. The one pitfall in the sound department that also ties back into the hit or miss comedy is the sound effects. Sweet lord in heaven, 
There's a lot of sound effects in this 30 minute pilot and you could have nixed handfuls of them and still had a working joke. Take these two scenes in specific. Look, my time is money, so I'll keep this short. You're not here because we wanted you here. You're here because Jeffrey couldn't make it for his cannibal cooking segment. You might be some royal big shot, but that doesn't mean shit to me. I'm too rich and too influential to give a flying fuck about what some tux wearing demon princess wants to advertise. No, 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 babe. Jokes are funny. I made you look, uh, sad and pathetic like an orphan with no arms or legs. Uh, oh, with progeria. Great. Now I'm bummed thinking about it. Having those sound effects in there clutters the shot's audio and kills the joke. An occasion that occurs far more often than scenes that could have used a sound effect as garnish, and hopefully this issue was ironed out in the full release. With a couple minutes left in the runtime, Serpentius shows up to crash the party, threatening to blast the hotel and Alistair off the face of the underworld, and before you can say, I've seen enough hentai to know where this is going, Al uses some voodoo magic to summon a horror terror and take the danger noodle in the airship down. Well, I'm starved! Who wants some jambalaya? And with the hotel being renamed to the show's title, the episode gives us a post-credits joke of Pench's defeat and ends there promising more to come, which it delivered on, with A24 picking it up and a full eight-episode season premiering on Amazon Prime back in January. There's a few snags in there, and the premise, humor, and art style are take it or leave it, but I had to go back and cover this pilot because there's a reason it blew up the internet the way it did when it first dropped. Internet animation and indie animation on YouTube have always been a thing, but not to this high of a quality and it was impressive that this pilot could be comparable to shows on television and streaming. The success of this pilot alone caused other artists to rise up and present their own proof of concepts for more shows that could get picked up for streaming or even thrive on YouTube. Hell Scandal Showman is a spin-off, The Amazing Digital Circus, Murder Drones, Ramshackle, Long Gone Gulch, even Lackadaisy finally made its debut in animation. What more can I say? Aspen Hotel is an interesting show with engaging characters and an intriguing premise that I'm completely, absolutely, positively, unabashedly, undoubtedly, totally certain they will never sideline for a more bombastic one, like a war between heaven and hell. But that'll be review for another time. I've spent too much time with this one on the back burner, and I've got two videos with strict deadlines to get back to, so I'll see you in October when I take the soul of an angel of double death too seriously. Thank you all for watching, and here's to another 3,000 subscribers. Snooping as usual, I see.